Hello again, everybody. This is Dan Clouser, and welcome back to the Journey of My Mother's Son podcast. Today, I'm joined with Christine Patton, who's a former attorney and judge, and decided after about 15 years in the legal field to walk away and ended up going into training of elite, of elite athletes. And later on, she wrote a book called Showing Up, Becoming the Me I Want to Be. And she's now a coach and inspirational speaker, which is different than a motivational speaker. So, Christine, before we get started with the conversation, just tell my audience a little bit, a little bit more about who Christine is. Sure. Thanks, Dan. I really appreciate the invitation. And just our short chat before we got on here showed that you and I share um, some really good human values um, and we align in our purpose. Um, we express it differently, but um, really good to be with you today. So thank you again. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I, I began my working career as a lawyer. I had wanted to become a lawyer from the time I was 12. I mean, what do you know when you're 12? Uh, apparently I knew everything. Um, <laughs> And uh, what happened for me throughout that process, I mean, I practiced insurance defense litigation. So I was a litigator. I was in the courtroom for eight years. But then I had I was married to a lawyer and I had two kids and um, good time to figure out that I valued my children's lives above my career. So I ended up retiring. Um, of course, when you're thrown from, you know, the courtroom and, and a practice in an office <laughs> to being at home, <laughs> that wasn't exactly smooth sailing either. So um, I went back to work part time in the courts as what's called in Ontario. I now live in BC, but in Ontario, it was a deputy judge in small claims court. So my jurisdiction was $10,000. And it was a part time, I worked anywhere from, I don't know, four or five, six days a month. So, you know, it was that beautiful balance for a mom with two small kids to uh, keep chaos at the door, you know, be at home most of the time and yet get out and be able to use the brain and, and all of that. So um, funny, funny enough, uh, that w it was a I, I'm, I'm kind of downloading this idea to to talk to your listeners about. And that is when you choose yourself in certain situations, doesn't matter what you do. And I chose myself because I was uh, uh, stress was, as you can imagine, way above me. I was buried. And I began, you know, the body begins to show the signs uh, when that happens. And I realized, you know, if I was dead, I was no good to anybody. <laughs> so I, so I, I took care of myself. I retired for one. Um, I took something that was more amenable to um, having more balance at home. And when I did that, I opened myself to, as you do, you know, when you quiet the nervous system, when you begin to relax, when you begin to heal, when you begin to just ah bring yourself down, that's when things can come in, ideas, thoughts, directions, the muse, we talked about the creative muse a little bit, can visit you. And so um, as it happened, my son was a, an elite athlete. Uh, my daughter was an elite dancer. She played soccer as well. But it's, it's Scott's teams that started inviting me to give the kids motivational talks. And I was like, okay, sure, whatever. <laughs> so I did. And it turned into something. Uh, I mean, at, at some point they were saying, you know, you, you're really good at this. You should do this. So I don't ignore things like that. That's an opportunity. And I did. And I created at the time the Mental Legend Sports Performance. I don't do it anymore. Um, and I was also in the schools and I was mentoring kids. And I had created a resilience program for high schools um, because resilience had become um, intelligently so, in my view, um, in the the um, education document in Ontario, or at least the region of Waterloo where I lived, they started to see the value of developing resilience in young kids. Like as early as 14, kids were reporting being so overwhelmed by stress, they couldn't get up and go to school. They think these are children. It's, it's awful what we're doing to our kids these days, but that's a whole other conversation. Anyway, so resilience was being welcomed into the school and they were also recognizing that one teacher can't do all of this stuff. So independent contractors were allowed to come in and teach and all that stuff. So anyway, I was doing that. Talk about fulfilling work. And I know, you know, you you get that given your background as well. Um, uh, and, and then wrote my book, Becoming the Me I Want to Be um, or Showing Up. <laughs> what is my book called? Showing Up, Becoming the Me I Want to Be. Um, and it came from the topics that I delivered to the kids when I was mentoring kids. And so. Anyway, long story short, I moved to BC, thought I could recreate the same 
pattern in my business and it was completely different out here. So I uh, began to look around and think, well, I mean, I'm in Kelowna, BC, you know, what, what's needed here? Where can I fit? And so I turned my attention, same nuggets. It's the same stuff that I teach. It's just now to people in business, entrepreneurs, uh, people who have big careers. Because sad fact number one, most of us have to work for a living. We've created that. And sad fact number two, many are many are, are overwhelmed and, and hate their work, frankly. Uh, a lot of my clients just don't like being there. So what a terrible situation to have to be somewhere all day and not like it. So my, my, uh, my purpose right now is to bring a little light to that. So. Yeah. I love that. And I just want to go back and revisit one of the things you said um, where uh, you know, one thing my mom used to say to me was uh, you know, sometimes you've got to do what you got to do for you. And I think a lot of times people, especially people like us who are, who are so used to, to giving, giving, giving that sometimes we drain ourselves, you know, and it's a lot of, I think it's tough for givers to take a step back and allow their cup to get refilled. But it's something that I had to learn over the years is that you, you can't fill from an empty cup. So you do have to take that step back and, um, you know, a lot of times it is, um, very okay to be selfish. Um, and, and I think that's one of the things when, um, when I was kind of fighting, um, closing the old chapter of, of my life and opening this, this new chapter, um, is that I had given and given and given, you know, for 30 years, um, you know, very few times ever thinking about myself. Um, and I, and I think God was really speaking to me saying, you know, it's, it's time, like you've done enough. And, um, you know, at, at times I was thinking to myself, well, this is, this is going to be very selfish to, to leave, leave, you know, this work that I'd done for 30 years of my life, literally 60% of my time on earth at that point in my life, I'd given to this organization. And uh, what, are, what are people going to do without me? And you know what? There's a little bit of ego in that too, right? Which we have to eventually address. Yeah. Yeah. Many uh, people feel that way. Many people. So this is good that you've raised this. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> me being selfish but it wasn't it was really to allow myself to you know to fill my cup again and give back in, in different ways you know so uh, <laughs> stopped giving back um you know with the volunteer work that we do with you know my blogging the, the podcast is a way of me giving but i'm also much more balanced than what i ever had been in my life so if you can just kind of give your perspective again of that you know, making a quote unquote selfish decision um, that really ends up benefiting everyone involved at that point and how important that was for you. Yeah, no question. Um, something that occurred to me before I address that, Dan, and don't let me forget because I go off on tangents and then I have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> or I do, but no one else can figure it out. Um, it, so I'm a heart math uh, trainer, resilience trainer. Um, and HeartMath is a company in California. I don't know if, if you've heard of it, but the idea is that we, we need to learn to live more by the intelligence of our heart. And there is a way to create what we call heart coherence within the body. This is based in science. This is based in medical research. It's very credible, credible research and tools and technology that they offer. Anyway, I can get into that more later, but um, there's something that they teach called care versus overcare. And many of us, we lose sight of what, what the balance is that you're talking about, of crossing that line into overgiving. You know, first, the first thing we do is we over identify with the needs of others. And we get emotionally involved. And that is what's draining. It's the emotional part of it that is draining when we we cross that boundary into what do they need? What do I need? And what am I capable of giving? So it's learning 
<clears throat> it's really learning in your own unique way. In my view, there's never anything that is one way. It's always take the wisdom and uniquely carve it out for yourself, right? So yeah, care versus over care, how we learn to give with balance. And then it sounds like you got that. I got that. I mean, I, as I said, I, the bottom line was, and I, I'm a cancer survivor. I had something when I was 26 and, and I was like, yeah, I am no good to anybody dead. So uh, that was my first order of business is I need to heal myself. And as I said, and what I know more about now foundationally scientifically is that when we quiet, we manage to quiet our immune system, sorry, quiet our nervous system which will enhance the immune system. Now, our, not only our body, but all facets of the body, the physical body, all of the cells can now work optimally. And I've often used this example. I thought it was a good one to give. Maybe it isn't. But imagine trying to write an exam in the New York Stock Exchange back in the 70s when there was telephones and bells and people screaming and all that stuff. I mean, could you? No, that's like our cells trying to operate and do their thing in our body with excess electricity running around with cortisol just rampaging toxicity through our cells. The cells cannot operate. It's why we get sick. It's why we get sick. The cells can't operate. Our body, like the earth, when we leave them alone, they have a natural coming up way of coming up and healing and being the natural, beautiful, super organic computers that they are. Um, so it's really a matter of, I think the way to say this, Dan, is to encapsulate is we just have to get out of our own way. Yeah. Right? That's, great, That's yeah. what that means. Stop, for God's sakes, stop and be quiet and just watch and see, but more importantly, see what you're doing how are you contributing to what's going on around you? You know, that's the empowerment piece is if you want more, if you want something different, guess what? You got to do something different. So let's get quiet first and then let's see where we need to go. Did I answer your question? <laughs> yeah, you definitely, you definitely did. And, and I think that's, you know, that's so important. And, you know, again, I think a lot of people just get caught up. You just get caught up in. Well, we do. We get, going, we get on the treadmill, right? Yeah. And, you know, again, something else that took me a while to, to learn is, you know, again, getting out into nature. And, you know, since we've been traveling, we, you know, we hike a lot more than we ever did, walk a lot more than we ever did. Um, and, and that sort of stuff is just, um, you know, so important. But you also have to be committed to it. You know, um, you, you've got to make sure you're carving out that time to allow yourself to do that. Um, and, it's, and again, it's, it's got to become a habit. Yes. It's got to become a habit like anything, right? And habits take time to form because that's how we create the addiction in ourselves with anything that we do, good or bad. Right? So. Yeah, love it. So when you made the switch from, um, you know, training elite youth athletes um, to, you know, corporate world clients. What, what was that like for you? I mean, what, what type of adjustments did you have to make? It was essentially the same message, just a little different of an audience. So how did you tweak it to kind of, you know, make it relevant to the new audience? Yeah, sure. No, that's a really good question. And it's one I hadn't really thought about. Um, I mean, obviously, kids and adults, not all of them, come with a different maturity level and, and sophistication, right? Um, and, and it's all experience. It's all experience. I'm not talking about who people are. I'm talking about just experience in the world. And as you and I talked about, this is, this is a good way to bring this in. Um, I used to find talking to the kids in school and talking to teams a really difficult gig because in schools, for example, they're forced to be there. They're forced to be there, what, six hours a day to listen to some adult talk at them and then have to 
cough up something somewhere down the road, right? So I think I often felt like I was another this, mm. right? Like, oh, God, we have to sit here and talk to this or listen to this woman. So I found that I, I felt like anyway, maybe I didn't, I don't know, but I felt like I had to gain their trust. I had to do and say things to get to get to their level, whatever that was. I almost said down and I didn't mean, and I didn't want to say that. I needed to get to their level <clears throat> and say things and talk like where they would like, oh, she gets me, you know, she, she is interested. So I would ask a lot of questions. Um, and it, it was how I spoke, I guess. And I, I don't know, the one, the one, the one thing isn't different is People like when you ask them questions. This is the beauty of podcasting. You can ask people questions and people love to talk about themselves. I mean, I'm a podcaster too. So um, it's great to explore those ideas. But it, but life was different for kids. I mean, they what I got about them was they're sitting in school. And of course, this was, I don't know, 10 years ago. Um, and there's pressure. I mean, I, it was often the leadership classes, the co-op classes that I spoke to often. And so they're looking at, you know, they're finishing grade 11, grade 12, grade 12, and then they're out, they're supposed to be working or at university or college or whatever. And it's terrifying because most kids had no freaking idea who they were, what they were supposed to do. And yet society was saying, you need to figure this out. Right. And, you know, the general way of doing this was go to the guidance counselor and find out on a list what you could do. And, oh, that's, that's a fulfilling way to figure out your career for life. So anyway, I, I loved opening the door for them and helping them recognize that who they were and how they operate this instrument is what was going to help them more in the world to find work that aligned with who they are. But how do you know that if you don't know who you are, right? That is the starting point for anybody. So um, the difference between them and the adults is that adults have had a couple goes at it a couple tries, right? With various careers or within the same company or have tried different businesses and have learned a lot more about themselves. So it's a matter of going, well, you know, that, that kind of didn't work. So how could we better, how could we make a better decision today? What have you learned about yourself? Like making it conscious, not an unconscious decision. And as you and I talked about the beauty of all of that, whether you're a student or an older person, whether you've been in business a long time, whether you're just starting is when you can help people get to that point where they feel, they don't think, they feel and experience the difference from what you've given them to live their life by. You watch the light go on. That is the jazz. But they have to take it, internalize it, practice it and go, oh, it's that, that now they're looking at you. Okay. For example, I've, I have this great story. I, I hope I'm not talking too much. Um, <laughs> so I, like you, I coached, I had the great opportunity to coach um, a minor baseball team. And I, and I, I started when they were 12 and I was like, <laughs> I don't know, it's a little young for me, but they, the coach wanted me in there. So I, I taught my, my course. And then the next year, of course, some of the parents were like, what the hell is she talking about? Anyway, <laughs> the coach still wanted me to come back the next year. And, and I got my heart mass certification. And so I was working, I was more working, I would go to their practices and I'd be on the field and I had have an opportunity to, to talk to the boys during practice. What's going on for you? Just between you and me, I'm not going to tell anybody, I'm never going to remember, you know, what's working, what's not working. Would you like a little help? And there's some were resistant. That's fine. I moved on and some were, would take it in. Anyway, here's what happened. It was the very last time I was with this team. And I think they were 14 by this time. And I was invited to come and watch their last game uh, or their last tournament. And of course it was a beautiful, I think it was a fall weekend. And, and I went on the Friday night. And, they, and the coaches surprised me. They said, you know what? We've brought these boys along as much as we can. Team's yours tonight. Yes. So um, they played their first game. And I, I was always about bringing people together and creating that chemistry. But you're not going to create it if you're looking over here, you're looking over here, you got your mind on that, right? 
it's it's attention to the core of what you're all doing. What's your purpose here and how are you going to do it and how are you going to do it in a cohesive, coherent, collaborative fashion? So I walked around the dugout and of course, you know, kids are 14. They're looking for their lunch or whatever. Somebody's up at bat. I'm like, whoa, dude, get over here. Everybody stand along here and you watch your batter. You send that guy energy. Send him whatever you think he needs to hit a home run. And they're like, oh. So it suddenly got very quiet. I, I'm not kidding, but batters were hitting better when they had the energy of the team behind him. Similarly, when their pitcher was out there, same thing. All the attention was on the pitcher. So anyway, what happened, Dan, is they won. They won that game. And they beat the first night. They beat a team that they'd never beaten before. They're like, ooh. So then they said, okay, come back tomorrow morning. We'd like you to coach the next game. I said, okay. So I came back. Now they're watching me a little more closely. And I'm saying, okay, here's what we're going to do today. We got three things we're going to focus on. They did it. They won. That game on Saturday afternoon, the hunger in their on their faces and in their eyes was palpable. And you could have heard a pin drop out on the, on the field. And so... I had them do something a little deeper and I said, same program here. We're going to just work it a little deeper. They won the game. They ended up winning the tournament and everybody looked at the team going, what just happened? And so it's just a matter of tweaking. I mean, you got to have the skill, you got to have the physicality, all of that, you know, this, um, it's just a matter of tweaking the attention and the thoughts, your empowerment pieces. Right? So, I just remember standing in the center of that circle of those boys and they were like, they were humming. They just wanted more. And I've never forgotten that moment. And actually a couple of them have gone on to colleges to play, to play ball. That's so cool. And, and it could, it does just go to, to show that, you know, positive energy is powerful. And I don't think um, enough people really understand how powerful your thoughts are and that sort of stuff. And, and I know that's a big part of your teachings, you know, the, the power within. So expand upon that a little bit more as far as, you know, just that the whole, you know, positivity and how like truly, truly scientifically proven that that is an asset to us as human beings. How much time do we have there? <laughs> Buckle up, folks. We're here for about six or 17 hours. Um, well, okay. Uh, when I coach, for example, everything I do kind of aligns with my coaching program. And that is there's an empowerment piece, there's a resilience piece, and there's a passion piece. And what I found was generally in my life and the life of other people is that when you figure out, when you empower yourself, when you figure out how you are going to get more of what you want, there's a jazz to that, right? Suddenly you become more powerful and you realize, ah, I'm more of an instigator here, not a reactor. And then as you take steps out and you empower yourself, stay true to yourself through the challenges. And in, in other words, learn resilience. You will get to that place. I promise you, you'll get to that place where now you're living your passions, your passions. What do you love to do? What do you long to do? Because that's what we're here to do. That's what we're here to do. We're not here to work. We're not here to hate our lives. We're not here to struggle and be overwhelmed. We're not here to do that. That's something we've created. We've gone down a deep, dark hole for so many reasons that we're not going to talk about. But when you learn what lights your own fire, sorry. 17 hours, that conversation. <laughs> we created that. Yeah, we'll need a couple drinks too. Um, so the empowerment piece revolves around the fact that I think it's important for all of us to understand that we live in a quantum universe. People go, yeah, whatever. What is that? We live in a participatory conscious universe. Everything around us is alive, right? The space between you and me is not empty. It's full. It's pregnant with possibilities. And we have to understand too that everything vibrates. We're in a, it's, it's a vibratory universe. So, so anything solid is at a lower vibratory rate or vibration and things we can't see are a higher vibration. 
but it's all here. It's all part of the matrix. I mean, read Greg Braden's divine matrix, read, Oh, there's, there's so much stuff out there. Rupert Sheldrake. I mean, it just, just the, the physicist, Albert Einstein. Um, th there's, Oh, you know what? A really good book to, to learn that journey is uh, Lynn McTaggart's the field. It, she's a scientific journalist and she has investigated all the way from, you know, Max Planck uh, at the beginning before even the, the uh, last century, um, all of the physicists uh, who have contributed to the knowledge that we have now, how to manipulate our universe, how to create, how to become a deliberate creator. That's really what it is. Lots of people talk about that. Um, you know, Abraham uh, and Esther Hicks is one. Mike Dooley is another one. There, there's lots of good ones. Anyway, they're just ones that come to mind right now. So that's the empowerment piece is figuring out how you play with that. And it's play. Life is a game. It really is. And that doesn't mean you short people. You short anything. It's not, that's not it. But <clears throat> when you approach your path, your purpose, what you want, what you want to develop in your life, what do you, what do you want to have it's a deliberate way of thinking. It's clean. It's it's what are your clean intentions? What is it you want? Do you know what's a sad thing, Dan? I would I don't know how many audiences, not just kids, but adults too. I'd say, okay, what makes you happy? Somebody tell me what makes you happy. Not one hand would go up. And I'd say, do you even know what makes you happy? Wow. People don't spend time thinking about that. Because we're busy working, we're busy fulfilling our obligations and all that stuff. And while I'm not knocking the fact that, yes, we have a life to live, we have to pay bills, we, we have obligations and all of that, it's the attitude about it. We need to shift that to more play and to do it with more positivity and light. So the positivity piece that you talked about, um, there's three ways to look at how we interact with our participatory universe, and that's John Wheeler, the physicist. Number one, you can think about it as what you give is what you get. So your thoughts, your words, your feelings, your actions all have an energy, right? And it goes out and it comes back. It may come back in a different circumstance, but it'll be the essence of the same lesson, right? So we're always, we should be always aware and learning. What are we sending out? What's coming back? The next is the law of attraction, which simply says what you give, you're going to get. So the arrow comes back. And there's no sense of humor. There's no judging whether you're a good person. Who gets to judge that? You are a good person. What are you sending out in terms of the quality of your thoughts, your feelings, your emotions, and your subconscious belief systems? That's that's almost a whole other, that's the 18th hour. Um, so it's managing all of that that will create a better energy that goes out that can be met. And again, participatory universe, that's what it is. And thirdly, you can look at it as the hologram or the holographic universe. And that is your life is always showing you how you're doing. So things that are showing up in your life that you love, good for you. You've created that. Pat yourself on the back. But things that aren't working so well. Ah, okay. How do I need to tweak this? How do I need to look at what I'm thinking, feeling, saying, doing, and my unconscious belief systems? And how do I make that better? That's the empowerment piece. The resilience is about creating, learning your body technology. That's what I'm big on right now is learning body technology. And it's not your mind. Your mind is your GPS. It keeps you safe. It keeps you situated in a place according to what you've learned. Now, what we learn in life is often subconscious, but it's also from outside sources. And our subconscious belief systems are created fully by the time we're seven years old. What's that saying? Give me the seven-year-old, I'll give you the man. So we have to be very aware that we've absorbed so much information and we live by these codes and this information and all this stuff that's not necessarily for us. It's not us. It's not true to our own purpose, our own desires, all of that. Um, well, I kind of got lost in that. But yeah, so the resilience piece is learning how to create the coherence within the body first so that you can quiet the nervous system. Um, now you're in a place to really hear what your life is about. And how do you do that? You look around, you look at what's happening, 
you look at how you feel, you learn your own pattern of communication within yourself. And that's the power within peace is how do you talk to yourself? You know, there's, there's the ego and there's the soul, yeah. right? I went to a, a really great weekend put on by coactive coaching out of California. There used to be CTI, but anyway, um, and it was called the dance of soul and ego. Yeah. Great, great um, title. And they asked us in the beginning of the weekend, which, which I often do now, what do you want to get out of this? What do you want to get out of this weekend? And I said, ultimately, I want to learn the voice of my ego and the voice of my soul so that I learn and know which one to obey. So the ego, of course, is that whole thing that's been created within us from society, our parents, whatever, right? And that energy is usually dissonant to our own energy. It can feel loud and clanging, like you must do this now. You have to have this now. That's more the ego talking to you. And many of us obey that because it's loud and it gets our attention and it doesn't go away, right? The soul, the resonance of the soul is resonant to us. It's a sympathetic resonance. It's who we really are. And it's quiet. until you get quiet, you're not going to hear that, right? So there's there's dissonant resonance, there's sympathetic resonance. And so the sympathetic resonance is what feels good. What is that voice in you that says, do this? It's quiet. So that was one of the, that was one of the most pivotal moments in my life is to learn how to listen to the messages of my heart and my body, the heart's intelligence and my intuition, as opposed to what my mind says I need right now. I think I went off in 12 different tangents there, Dan, sorry. <laughs> How did I do? <laughs> they great. They were, okay. they were some powerful tangents for sure. Okay. No doubt about it. So um, we're just about out of time, but um, before I get to my final question, is there anything that we didn't cover that you would like to, uh, to talk about? <clears throat> no, J just, just that thing is when you want to make a change and create a habit, get quiet. Get quiet because now you can hear the voice of your soul talk to you. This is what you need to be doing. Not that. Um, you can hear messages from outside. Um, and guidance is just waiting. It's just waiting. But until you get quiet, it's not going to happen. I love that. Christine, how do people get in touch with you? If they want to engage you with coaching or get a copy of the book, any of that sort of stuff, how do they, how do they find Christine Patton out there in the internet. The ethers for sure. Uh, you can go to my website, powerwithin.ca. <clears throat> you can reach out to me at Chris, C H R I S, at powerwithin.ca. I'm on Instagram, LinkedIn, uh, Facebook. Um, Instagram is Power Within Chris. Facebook is Power Within Coaching. LinkedIn is Christine Patton. Um, I think that's pretty fertile. Dan, thank you so much for this opportunity to, to talk about what's really important to me and I think um, might be important to other people wherever they are in their lives. And it's been great to connect with you too. I think you're awesome and I wish you really well with what you're doing in the future and now. I appreciate that. appreciate that. So that, that brings me to my final question. I ask all my guests the same final question because the subtitle of the podcast is Many Little People in Many Little Places, which comes from the opening lyrics of a song by Michael Fronte, uh, Gloria, which go, when many little people in many little places do many little things, then the whole world changes. So it's one of the little things that Christine does to make the world a little bit better place. Spread love. That's all we need. Yeah. That's all we need. And here it is. When you love yourself, really love yourself, you love others. We're all one. I love that. I love that. Christine, thank you so much. And for folks out there listening, be sure to check out my other podcasts and blogs at journeymymotherson.com or danclouser.com. Uh, while you're on the website, pick, a cup, pick up a copy of the latest book, The Journey of My Mother's Son, Volume 1. Christine, thank you again for the opportunity. This, uh, this was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you. Me too. Take care. Thanks.